did your boss have any well wishes for you or no. any advice? He said that he was surprised and he expected me to sit at my desk for the next two weeks. And so I said, <laughs> I said, I said to him, well, I don't have any That's more crazy. work to do. Right. And he said, you'll figure something out. And I still remember that to this day. I remember his face when he said it. I remember him saying, you'll figure something out. And I just went back to my desk and I'm like, okay, if I walk out now, I'm for sure never coming back to the music industry. And I did anyway, because I said to myself, I can make no baked work. For the life of me, I will do whatever it takes to make this successful and I will not come back to this industry. So I walked out, I left my ID badge, my parking pass, on the desk. I didn't say bye to anyone. I, I went downstairs, got in my car, and then I Googled, how do you ship a refrigerated <laughs> product? <laughs> this is Startup Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guests are Megan and Jimmy Feeman, the married duo behind No Baked Cookie Dough. Most of us can probably relate to sitting at work, wishing you could just walk out the door and chase your dreams. Megan actually did it. She may have thought the music industry would be a good fit for her when she started her career, but once she felt the calling to branch out on her own, she was gone, and no one was going to tell her otherwise. It's that kind of entrepreneurial fire that has driven Megan and Jimmy to lead an ever-expanding business, one that has led them from scoop shops to pop-ups to e-commerce and everything in between. So listen in as we cover everything from why being able to eliminate fear is an important part of entrepreneurship why a hit on your credit score shouldn't deter you from making business decisions, and why you should let procrastination be your guide. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Megan and Jimmy from No Baked Cookie Dough. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for, for having uh, us. Of thanks course. for having us. For people who don't know, what does your company do? So we make safe-to-eat and bakeable cookie dough. Okay. And what made you want to go down this delicious journey? What was the moment where you're like, this is it? It was early 2017. Jimmy and I were about a year and a half out of college, okay. both working, you know, a nine to five office job. Not in food, not in not anything. Not in food. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. <laughs> I had gone to school for music business, okay. um, which is pretty common in Nashville. I wanted to work in the country music industry. I was one of the lucky people who actually got a job in the music industry, which I felt very excited about coming out of college. But then I was about a year and a half into going into an office every day, sitting in a cubicle, staring at a computer, putting data in, basically doing a job that I felt like a robot should be doing. And I was just miserable. I felt like I had no control over my future, over my success, how far I could advance, what I was spending my time doing. And it's like when you're working a nine to five job, most of your life is spent at work. You know, like the things you're doing outside of work are not how you're spending most of your time. So I was so miserable doing that, that it was just bleeding into the rest of my life. And I was questioning everything at that point. Why did I go to college? Yeah. This isn't as yeah. green. Yeah, Why did I go to college cool? yeah. and spend, you know, over a hundred grand on a degree to work in this industry, to sit in right. this cubicle. And why did I intern full time during college to get this experience? And that was kind of the point where I was like, I just can't do this anymore. You know, I am mm -hmm. wasting my life away. And I had only ever created one thing that was original to me. And that was a cookie dough recipe. I love cookie dough. I always have. It might sound weird, but it's like that was my dessert of choice. You know, some people have like a candy stash in their cabinet. Some people have pints of Ben and Jerry's in their freezer, you know, sure. for when they want that late night snack or whenever the case may be. But I had flour, sugar and butter always because mm -hmm. I would make, you know, some kind of confection that resembled cookie dough that I felt like I could eat because I was leaving eggs out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I had created this chocolate chip recipe that was safe to eat. I thought it tasted delicious. And I was like, I can't possibly be the only person in the world who likes to eat cookie dough as a snack food. I, it just can't be possible. Truth. So yeah. I took that, I took that recipe. I took the idea of starting what is now no baked and I just said to myself, I can't do this job anymore. I should try to do my own thing mm -hmm. and just see what happens. 
And did you quit right away or was there a time where you're like, yeah, you did, you went cold turkey? So kind of. Basically, I spent all of my lunch breaks at this job that I was working, creating like a Squarespace website and okay. an Instagram page. And I delivered samples of the cookie dough to local Nashville influencers just in the area. And I told them like, I'm launching on this day. If you could just post about it, that would be awesome. You know, wow. we're a local up and coming business. I really had no plan. I had no idea what I was going to do, but mm -hmm. I at least like sold this small vision to them. Yeah. And Nashville is the kind of place that really supports local and yeah, new things. Yeah, it's very things. collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. A, a great community for businesses. So I did that just kind of hoping they would post and I would at least get some kind of traction. And so it was March 30th of 2017 and I launched the website where people could order online. And I just said, you know, we'll deliver it to you or ship it to you. I really didn't have a plan. Again, I was just kind of winging it. Still had my job. It was a Sunday and I think I maybe got 10 orders. Okay. But Which is I, huge. I mean, that's I, at that I, moment in yeah, time. Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh. Like the, the first order came through and I was like, wow, someone actually bought this. I can't even believe and it. it wasn't your cousin or your mom. No, just a <laughs> random person. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And I went into work the next day, still had my job. And I think I spent the first two hours staring at my computer, going to like the phone room, calling Jimmy, calling my mom, being like, I want to quit. Like, I think I should quit. I think I should quit right now. Oh, wow. And it I was just that. this internal argument where, with myself where I was like, okay, I have this job at this huge company in the music industry. I spent the past four years of my life going to school, interning, getting the experience that I needed to get this to get job. job. Right. If I walk away from this today, I'm never, like, I can't come back. It's like a kiss of death. Yeah, you can't come back from that. You know, you're walking away from a very notable place that people will listen to what they say. Yeah. And I just said to myself, okay, like, I either make no baked work or I don't know what I'll do. On that phone call, did your mom or Jimmy give you good advice? Because I think most parents, given in, in how they grew up, right, where yeah. they're chasing security, they want to support you. But most of them is saying, no, like, stay in this job. You're very lucky. Yeah. They'll try to convince you to stay. Yeah. And we definitely, in the beginning, I think both Jimmy and I got that from some of our family. I am super lucky because my parents are entrepreneurs. So oh, nice. they never had that, like, you have to go to college. You have to get a job out of school. You have to save money and buy a house. They mm -hmm. never had that mindset. Right. So fortunately, when, you know, I was on the phone with my mom, it was like, a, yeah, you, sh you should go for it. And with Jimmy, obviously, he was like, you should definitely go for yeah, this. I like, totally we can quit. do it. Yeah. <laughs> Lighter and not so, fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and <down>. I, <laughs> I did. I walked into my boss's office and I said, you know, I started this business. I really want to put everything I have into it. And you haven't given me any work to do. Like, I was at the point where they would give me things to work on. I would finish and then I'd tell them I was finished and they'd say, okay, hang tight. Right. And I'd sit right. at my desk and think, why are they even paying me to sit here? Right. It could be freelance or it could be per hour. Yeah. Is that what you can do the best I of mean, both? I mean, they could outsource everything I was doing and, yeah. and it's just not how such big companies work. So yeah, I... Did your boss have any, uh, I don't know, well wishes for you or no, any advice? He said... You're making a huge mistake. He basically said that he was surprised and he expected me to sit at my desk for the next two weeks. And so I said, <laughs> I said, I said to him, well, I don't have any That's more crazy. work to do. Right. And he said, you'll figure something out. And I still remember that to this day. I remember his face when he said it. I remember him saying, you'll figure something out. And I just went back to my desk and I'm like, okay. If I walk out now, I'm for sure never never coming back to the music industry. Like I would be the person who walked out after this executive at a huge company told me not to. And I did anyway, because I said to myself, I can make no baked work. Okay. Like for the life of me, I will do whatever it takes to make this successful and I will not come back to this industry. I love that. And I that was the that. moment. <laughs> no, and so you legit exactly. left right there that I day. Left. I walked out. I left my ID badge, my parking pass on the desk. I didn't say bye to anyone. I, I went downstairs, got in my car, and then I Googled, how do you ship a refrigerated <laughs> product? <laughs>
<laughs> That's such and a I, good story. I went to like all these stores, restaurant depot, these places I had never even seen looking for like gel packs and Okay. So now you're trying to figure out the shipping thing. But yep. at the same time, did any of these influencers or the Instagram people did they did they place any orders or did you see any signals from the market around like, oh yeah, people are not following me? Because Nashville is very collaborative. I think Nashville and yeah. Los Angeles are probably like the two most collaborative economies in the United States where everyone's trying to help you out. Yeah. Uh, I grew up in Boston. It's not like that. Everyone's, <laughs> it's like dog eat dog. New York's very much the same way. Chicago's kind of a mix of two. But being in the right city, I tell people all the time, like I tell people I'm a tropical flower, which means like I can only grow in certain climates. Mm -hmm. And LA becomes that climate for me. And I think Nashville for entrepreneurs has that also. Yeah. When they were helping you, what what was some of the things like, did you notice anything right away? Were they trying the product? Were they posting it? And they were like, oh, this is maybe the best product I've ever had. Or Yeah, I think some of the first encouragement I got was actually from them because they were very honest in their feedback. They said, this is super delicious. Like, have you ever thought about doing this flavor? Or like, would you consider doing this with it? Okay. And so getting their honest feedback and then seeing them actually post because you know, these influencers do have a certain level of credibility they have to keep. Sure. So, I mean, every influencer does, but it's like they're not going to post about something they don't like. Exactly. They, they don't want their really followers like to get something and be like, why would you like this is terrible. Right. So just the fact that they even posted when I was just giving them free samples, I didn't pay them or anything made me feel confident that I had actually made something that tasted good. Yeah. And then, Jimmy, what, what is your story? In so this. my story is Megan kept calling me <laughs> and then she kept recruiting me to the kitchen. Eventually, you know, as the business grew throughout the first two months, I found myself focusing more on no baked than my own job. And what were you doing at the time? Um, at the time I was actually working for the Tennessee department of treasury and okay. I was helping them raise money for their college savings plan. I had been doing stuff like that wow. since I'd left college. So like, finance heavy. finance heavy like sales stuff and yeah. i didn't like it at okay. all what didn't you like about it i think the thing i didn't like was i wasn't passionate about what i was doing sure so i would attempt to be passionate by like mm. either finding new ways to make what i was doing interesting or finding like new jobs essentially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like i switched jobs three times okay in a year and a half okay it's the sign of an entrepreneur yeah, sometimes switching jobs or just being fired from a job are literally like the best things that could happen to you. Yeah. Because you realize it's not you. You're like, oh, it's it's the thing I'm doing that sucks. It's not me. And there's this weird moment in that because sometimes people get down on themselves thinking like, oh, maybe I'm not meant for this world or whatever. But it's just like it, their world looks different. That's all. Yeah. And you start to realize that you might be after something that you can't really put your finger on. No Baked became that thing for me. Okay. So I quit my job in July of that year. Megan started it the end of March. So March 31st is the first day she posted on Instagram. We consider that the birthday of No Baked. And there was this moment right before I quit my job that kind of like pushed me over the edge where we had a pop-up event. It's called like the Centennial Spring Bash. And it happens in Nashville every year. It's like makers and, you know, people who are hoping to start a CPG company or whatever mm -hmm. are like out there trying to sell their products. And we had a line of people buying our cookie dough for like two and a half hours. Wow. And it was like that first moment of validation where you're like, and you're, in, you're just in a work. tent, right? Yeah. You're just in a tent with a cooler. Okay. Yeah. And you've got some wow. cookie dough in jars and it's not really perfect. Yeah. Um, and it's just the both of you. Yeah. And you've loaded your car full to, to unload yeah. And we have like famous day. people coming and buying cookie dough from us <laughs> at this thing. And we're like, this doesn't make any sense. And they're but loving it. Does. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, that's the moment where we were both like, yeah, we're all in. That's awesome. And that's also the moment our parents thought we were crazy. Because I oh. think Megan's parents were comforted in the fact that, like, I was still working. Okay. And so, like, yeah. someone has working. security. I think my dad, that was the first time he had come in person and, like, seen No Baked sell anything. And I just remember him sitting, like, underneath the pop-up tent and being like, huh, like, this is interesting. And I'm like, yeah, see? Like, this is the thing. People like this. It could work. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> Told and you. I think it's normal. Like parents obviously want some kind of safety and security for their kids, but yeah, it's definitely friends and all your relatives too. I, I talked with one of my good friends about this just two days ago. A lot of the time, like the worst advice you can get is advice that's like coming from a good place. So like friends, relatives, parents being like, Hey, where you're at right now, is good. You really shouldn't risk anymore. 
or you really shouldn't like overextend yourself. You really shouldn't try for more. Like when we were doing the pop-ups and they were doing well, it was like, Hey, why would you guys want to start a scoop shop? Yeah. And then after the first scoop shop did well, it was like, Hey, aren't you cool with the scoop shop? Maybe you shouldn't try opening more and so on and so on. Like, why would you keep trying to evolve this thing? Because each time you do it, you do stick your neck out there. I will say though, that when you, I don't want to say prove them wrong, but when you feel what it's like to be right, like mm-hmm. yourself, there's, you get addicted to that. Yeah. Right. Like you're like, I knew it. I knew this would work. <laughs> and then, and then yeah. ideas don't sound so crazy anymore. Right. Right. And now you're like, oh, let's do 20 listen. stores. Oh, what is distribution <laughs> going to be like there? Oh, we'll figure that out. But you get addicted to chasing the, it's almost like the continuous knowledge. You're just kind of like, yeah, I can do it. It looks the same, but it's a little bit bigger. Let's just move forward. That's it's exactly addicting. what it's like. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. the absolute best. And so I want to go back. So for the first month, what was that like? Like, are, are there orders coming in every day? Wild. Is it like, <laughs> is it hit or miss? Is it, how do we get this out there? It was definitely hit or miss. Yeah, I'd say not a constant flow of online orders, but a constant enough flow of people inviting us to pop up. So we originally launched the online store, but then, you know, the next weekend I had a pop-up shop planned at the college that Jimmy and I went to. And once we did that pop-up shop, we realized, you know, at the time, this is 2017, people want to come in person and buy the cookie dough instead of ordering it online. Mm -hmm. It's safer. They can try it. Yeah. Yeah. And they were all located in Nashville at the time. That was really the only reach we had. So they were like, why can't we just buy it in person when we're in the same city? So we kind of put a ton of focus into starting pop-up shops and those were consistent enough to where we were like, okay, we've really got to figure out what we're doing. Yeah. Like, then you've got the operational issues. Like mm-hmm. you, like we had said, like neither of us had worked in food. Neither of us knew what we were doing, but that's another cool part about Nashville in particular is there's a really cool food scene, not necessarily in CPG, but in like just food in general. Yeah. So we worked out of this really cool commercial kitchen called citizens kitchen, which now is way bigger than it was back then. And they gave us a ton of advice. Just being around other entrepreneurs that were trying to do it, that invigorated us. And it also gave us the knowledge that we needed to solve certain problems that you wouldn't think were problems. Like, how do you make a really big batch of cookie dough? Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Prior to that, it's like me in the kitchen with measuring cups being like, okay, well, if I multiply, you know, a cup of flour by 10, I'll get 10 jars of cookie dough. And it's like, that's not how, that's not how it works, commercial yeah. baking works. So tons of stuff to learn just about the food industry, about how food works, the regulations around it. It was a huge learning curve. And from a marketing perspective, were you guys basically just on Instagram, yeah. Facebook, that's it? I was exclusively doing Instagram at the time, you know, just working with influencers, posting our pop-up shops, maybe doing some like paid promotion posts, mm-hmm. but that's it. Okay. And that was working. And then in terms of how you guys were financing it, are you just, everything you're making, you're putting back into the business or did you guys? I think I put got your like savings 10 new stuff? credit cards that year. Oh, for oh sure. wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and that all, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's weird when you actually look at the way that we like funded the business. Cause the first summer, which was like just pop-up shops and online store and quitting our jobs. Like, I think I maxed out my last credit card just trying to like pay for stuff for no baked and then just paying our bills. Cause yeah. obviously we still had to pay rent and like eat right, food. Right. And then we just had this really cool time, like getting the first store open where we didn't have enough money for a contractor, but Megan was able to take out all these credit cards and I was able to convince my dad to come help me like build wow. part of the store. And it was just this really cool, like seven week period where we found this old restaurant we redid like the bar that used to be like a cocktail bar into a cookie dough bar. It was this old house. So we like painted it white and tried to make it look cool. Yeah. I was very stubborn at the time. I was like, I'm not taking money from anybody. We will do this ourselves. I have good credit. Let's just get everything we can. How much debt did you guys get into? Enough. It wasn't so much. It was probably like 35 or 40 grand. And then we paid all of that off in the first month of having that store open. Oh wow. That the store killed it. Was it stressful? Oh, yeah. maxing out credit cards at the time yeah i, I want to say yes but there were we went back and did it again you saw it yeah you, i was three, gonna three say months later not you knew stressful what it meant. enough for us to be like yeah. we shouldn't be doing i this. mean we were 23 and really yeah i don't want to say dumb but just naive yeah. yeah so like we went back we were like 
this store did really well. This is like a month and a half in. We're like, we're bored. Let's build another store, yeah. which is probably not the best idea. It ended up working out, yeah. but like we went in, doubled down. We actually paid for a firm to come in and like help us with like franchise documents. So we got like a law firm for franchising, paid for that, paid for some operations consultants to help us make like an ops manual and then built the Louisville store and maxed all our credit cards out again. And this is like February of 2018. So like the business isn't even a year old. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, we're just all in. And then that one all did the even better than the first one. And so then we got the mindset well, we can't do anything wrong, you know? Like, we must be amazing at this. We know what we're doing. <laughs> like, this is flawless. Right, right, right. Which is obviously not true. Yeah. Like, probably with any business, but that was us at the time. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that led us into, like, the first season of, like, issues that we had as a company. I want to talk about one thing because this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. It's the concept of, if I don't have seed capital and I'm gonna go use my credit cards, there's this thing that holds them back around like, oh, my credit score is gonna go to crap. And I always tell them like, it's just a construct. It doesn't really matter. And like the fact of you saying that your freedom hinges on a score that you right. definitely don't need and worst case can improve over the course of six months or a year or two years or any time really. It holds, like there's a real thing that holds people back from it's like, I have this great credit score. It took me so long to build it. I want to keep it. Yeah. But it's this like false, that's exactly it. Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a thing of like, don't do that. Yeah, Jimmy and I have the mindset of like, if we can't afford to buy something, we're not going to buy it. And also at the same time, No Baked is our savings. No Baked is our future. Yeah. Why no would we all the let, wealth that we have. Right. Yeah, whole that, is, in it. that is where, you know, we score ourselves. Why would we let some made up thing from society prevent us from building the thing that's actually going to be our future you're not success. buying bentley's you're no. just <laughs> investing in your don't business. get me not wrong we went through periods of time where we were like yes we should buy expensive things live in these expensive places but yeah us yeah. today we just lived in a bus for three and a half months so i think it, it just takes phases of like learning what actually matters to you. It's Everybody's a cool different. thing that entrepreneurs go through sometimes too. Like in your early 20s, if you're the type of person that came right out and was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur for a living. And maybe it's not always the same company. Maybe you have some like fails. Maybe you have some like wins. But it's always like on that first big win, a lot of guys will go out, a lot of guys and girls will go out and just buy something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You have to have like all of those things happen to you in order to gain perspective and even the credit card thing and credit score, like you have to actually like really break what society has told you over and over again by actually going out and acting on it. Or you're going to continue to believe like this credit score defines me yeah. or like whatever it might be, like how much money you have in the bank or whatever it is. Instead of focusing on like the purpose or mission that you're going after. Like now all we think about is like, how do we get our cookie dough into as many stores as possible? How do we get it in front of as many customers as possible? How do we drive toward the mission instead of like how much money can we make or things like how can I improve my credit score? These like things that people want to define themselves off of when really it's just about like the mission that you're out to do. The impact. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. When people ask me like, what, what do I solve for? I'm like, I'm always solving for impact. Mm -hmm. And so in real estate development, it's like I have the option I can do I can do residential, right? So I can build this like beautiful multifamily building and maybe 45 people live in it. Mm -hmm. Or I can build this coffee shop, which, you know, 200 people come to a day. Yep. And like yep. one of them is way more impactful than the other. And like with a podcast, it's like we distribute this everywhere, wherever it goes, people listen to it. And so that's the impact. We're just chasing impact. Right. And it keeps it honest and it's like super refreshing. And I mean, it's awesome, you know, but that's like, that's my North Star. And so it's, that's what I'm always trying to solve for is impact, not, not money. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be figured out for me. Like we have a rule in our house. I, it's a rule. Really. I just said, it's like, I don't buy anything big or fancy unless, unless I've sold something. And so if I sold the company or if I've sold the building, that's when I'll lean into like, let's go ham, like whatever, you know, max it all. Like you're good with it because you have to, I've learned that you have to celebrate some of the wins. Yeah. Otherwise you it's like, what's the point? You definitely have to reward yourself yeah. if something good happens. And I think we still do that, but you know, there, there were periods of time 
where we were like, this is so great. Let's, let's buy a Tesla, you know, like yeah, yeah. just things looking like things that today we would be a little more hesitant about. What happened when COVID hit your business and your location set oh, to can close? I tell the story? Yeah. I love the story. It. So <laughs> September of 2019, Megan and I, so this is about two and a half years after we started the company from just our apartment. We had eight stores open, three franchisees were, so three of the eight stores were franchised. We were doing well from the outside, like looking in. Our average unit volume at each store that we opened was lower and lower and lower each time we opened a store. The stores in Nashville were doing really well. And Meg and I really didn't like what we did for a living. So I didn't like running the scoop shops. And, and neither did Megan. And we'd gotten in so deep that it's all we did. And, you know, you, uh, you add a new door, like you add a new shop, like it's twice as much work. So we basically signed up for five times as much work, plus the franchisees mentoring them and, and helping them succeed. And not only did we just not have it in us at the time, which I think we've grown over time and, you know, continually done better. But like at the time, it was like, dude, we just we just don't like doing this. So we decided like, hey, we need to go back to trying to sell online, try to get back to the product, because that's why we started the business. Like Megan loved her cookie dough. I loved it. That's what we liked doing, liked sharing it with people. I loved to do in pop-up events. I just wanted to get the cookie dough in front of more customers. And that was kind of what we were desperate for. And we thought the way was scoop shops when really it was, you need to solve for the best distribution model, the best impacts, like what you said. So like really figure out like, how do I have the most impact with my product? Well, it was really CPG the whole time. The margins just aren't very good in CPG. So when you're younger and you're a little short-term minded, you're going to be like, well, let me open this scoop shop where I can make insane gross margin versus like if I go to a grocery store, I'm making nothing. So at the time we were more focused on money and not impacts. So in September, October of 2019, we changed that mindset, we put together this plan of we're going to sell online. We're going to try to prove it as a CPG product and then kind of go from there. We're going to pivot the company. So that was interesting because it happened right before COVID. That winter was really hard. We had really overextended ourselves the summer before building stores. So we're coming into February really low on cash, like super low. Like Megan and I haven't paid ourselves in like seven months. We're in like the red zone <laughs> as far as like a company. And then we had a tornado in Nashville and shut one of our stores down. And it was a store we were actually trying to shut down. So we were like, all right, well, we were going to pivot this store into a production facility. Mm -hmm. So let's just go in, you know, when they clean up the tornado damage and we're going to do production there and start shipping our online orders out of that store. This is March of March 3rd of 2020. And obviously at that point, we're like tracking COVID saying like, you know, I wonder what will happen if this actually gets here. Like what happens to our business? Because we're food and people have to come in. So it was kind of already in our head, like what might happen. And Megan was also nine months pregnant at the time. Wow. So it was a very rough month. That's a stressful to be. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. You don't pay yourself for seven um, months. You're nine months pregnant. Yep. Yeah. It There's was a tornado. It, it, was, COVID. it was wild. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> okay. March 16th, we shut all our stores down. And I actually had been driving back and forth to Cincinnati at the time because we had lost our manager recently. And March 16th actually felt really good. Like, it's weird to talk about, but I had told you already, like, back in September, we were like, hey, we don't really like doing this business. Yeah, and it made I, it obvious for you. Yeah, and I grinded all winter yeah. trying to, like, make sure, like, we're cutting costs. Like, I'm in the stores, like, helping the managers do things. Like, really getting my hands dirty in the business. And I was working, like, 80 hours a week doing something I didn't like doing. So then March 16th rolls around, and I'm like, all right, this feels kind of freeing. This is weird. That feeling led into, I think, the success, that feeling and then the clarity that Megan had, because right after that, on that day, she said something to me that was so powerful. She was like, look, like, we're just going to have to, like, make it through and put together a plan to survive. But we didn't just put a plan together to survive. We took this plan that we had already had to grow the online store and we just put it into overdrive. Like, let's take all the employees that were at our scoop shops, bring them over to that Germantown store. Let's start producing cookie dough. Let's post and contact all the influencers we've ever worked with, have them post about it. Let's partner with our friend that runs a digital agency and like start spending money on Facebook ads. Like we had no cash in the bank and he was like, just commit $400 a day, $300, $400 a day to Instagram ads and see what happens. And 
all of the stars just aligns because anyone that was doing e-com at the time knows Facebook returns were better than they'd been since 2014. The influencer posting worked. Our online store sales went from like 20 grand a month to like 80 grand a week. It, it was insane. Like wild stuff. Like we were getting like 200 orders a day. And so by the end of March, like our daughter was born on March 31st and I was able to like go to the hospital with Megan and, and not work and not check my email. It was like a complete shift. It happened over two weeks and it took no money. I mean, you could say the pandemic like spurred it on, but really the only thing that really needed to happen was we needed to be like, we're shifting. Like we had said we were going to pivot and we didn't for months. We just set up the online store again, started sort of marketing it, weren't putting a lot of effort into it. It was a shift in effort. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. so weird. <laughs> like I love that. And, and COVID forced it to happen. We kind of were just very honest with ourselves about what we needed to do. And then my marketing plan became like, let's just be very honest with our customers. Like I literally posted pictures of our staff members and I was like, look, we don't want to lose these people. These people will pay their mortgages with the money we pay them. Please like, if you've ever wanted to support us, if you've ever wanted to buy cookie dough, this is the time. And I think the fact that we were so transparent actually worked. That's crazy. That's a good story. That's a really, really good story. Congratulations on your daughter. Oh, thank <laughs> you. And at least you, she entered the world with some clarity <laughs> from yeah. your business. You know, it's, during COVID, we interviewed a lot of companies. And I think the thing that I took away the most was, is it forced them to do the only thing that was working? And it forced them to just focus on that one thing because all of a sudden nobody was in, no one's going to stores, there's no crowds. And so if you're a food truck or whatever you are, it's over. But if you're in the grocery market or e-commerce, that's it. Like that's where you have to go. And if you can control your own supply chain, then you're golden, right? Because it's not like you're waiting on China for the shipment. It's like you're making it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just about scaling up. And in that, you know, I think all the companies we've spoken to like did the best ever. They did their two, four, five times better than any other previous year or month, just because it made it simple. It made business simple, simple in quotes of like, yeah, yeah they knew what to focus on because there was only one thing working. That's probably true for yeah. a lot of people. Did you get out of all the leases or how did, did you close some down? We did close some down. Today we have three corporate stores that are still open. Two of our franchisees are still open. We've really shifted our business model too for our scoop shops to focus a lot on delivery, making the product more accessible to people that way. And also for like our Uber corporate Eats and stuff like that. Yeah. Or? Okay. Got it. And for our corporate stores, it's more about brand recognition. So two of the original five stores remain. We actually opened a new store a few months ago on Broadway in Nashville. And it's just a like small kiosk inside a food hall, but it's a small kiosk inside a food hall that gets 17 million visitors a year. So it's like the idea of brand recognition and the idea of continuing to like focus on, I guess the thing that makes the largest impact, dude, I love that. <laughs> I'm going to start stealing it. Yeah. Take Cause it. it's, take it. it's one of those things that it actually makes a lot of sense. Like that's, that's where our head's at. Like how do we get our brand in front of as many people as possible? So we can let the consumer decide, like, do they like our cookie dough? And yeah. if they do, then, you know, we have something and yeah. if they don't, then we'll figure it out. And how many flavors do you guys have today? So we usually have eight flavors at all times. Um, sometimes we have seasonal flavors, monthly flavors, but pretty much eight constant flavors. What are your favorites? What are your, like your top three? My favorite is s'mores, which oh. is actually not one of our most popular flavors, sadly. I would tell people to order it more. <laughs> um, and then chocolate chip, which was the original, and then brownie batter. Okay. My favorite is definitely chocolate chip. And then um, we actually have lemon sugar. It's about to not be available anymore, but I, yeah, I love that flavor. flavor. Yeah, lemon sugar. As you guys think about your daughter, now that you, mentally you're in a place of like, okay, now we're, life's, life's bigger than us in yeah. a very real way. How do you view like how she will grow up uh, with her parents as titans in the <laughs> cookie dough world? <laughs> like like she'll, she'll be like, yeah, my parents live a fake life. Like my dad doesn't wear a suit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, my hope is that that becomes normal. You know, yeah. like my parents are small business owners, but even for me, I didn't grow up with this like idea that you know your dad goes to work in a suit sits in an office all day and then comes home it's like 
half the time I was in their warehouse climbing on rolls of carpet. Like they have a business in the flooring industry. So my hope is that we can expose her to enough of it to where she thinks that entrepreneurship and kind of, you know, building your own thing is normal and that she doesn't have to follow what society tells her she should follow. I mean, it's it's really cool if we're able to not just show her, but continue to show other people that life is a little bit more about creativity than what people would lead you to believe. Like you can totally go to a great college, get a good job, make a decent salary, you know, like have good credit. And a lot of people like doing that. That That's fine. It's very linear. I mean, it's It's very linear. Yeah. (laughs) Whereas like the people I've seen in life that are the happiest or the most successful are really enjoying themselves. They're just being creative. They're just doing what they like to do or they're trying to find things that they find interesting and trying to just like, whether it be solve problems or just make something that's beautiful or cool. I've always had a ton of respect for my friends in Nashville and actually out here now that whether they're pursuing like music or art or a new business or whatever it might be, I like those things. Like those people are, are at least trying to do it. Like they're trying to make something cool happen. And there's nothing wrong, like Megan said, with like just the normal linear path, but it's not the only the only way. Yeah. I think the one thing that you're touching on that I've I've recognized recently is the more I do these kinds of things, the more I feel like an artist, which sounds so crazy. Like I went to school for civil engineering, we're mega logical, we're math, you know, and then I went to business school and it's like same thing. It's like super linear, very business. And so the thought of me saying the word like I feel like I'm becoming an artist is crazy. Like it's a hard left. But the more I do this, that's how it feels. Like there's a real, in business, you learn how to let things flower on their own. Even that sounds like, like that you'll never hear any business student You're starting student with a blank canvas. Say that. Yeah. And drawing and you're creating. something as you go. Yeah. Yeah, you're creating. And so what I think about it is like you, you, you criticize through creation. You know, you see what doesn't exist in the world that you think should. And then you put a coffee shop in West Hollywood. And you're like, this, <laughs> <laughs> this should be here for yeah. the people, you know? And I think it's a, such a different mindset when you realize you're in control of that. Like you're in control of the rules. Yeah. It's a way different mindset too when like you probably went to business school with the thought process of like, well, we'll give you this business and you'll manage it hmm. versus like growing it from like a baby little seedling right. of, of an idea. Like that's right. artistry. Yeah. Whereas like managing something may not necessarily always have to be artistry, but it can be. Do you guys ever think about maybe hiring like an operations person that just runs the stores or are you guys so fixated on just the e-commerce side of it now? That's actually what we did. We did recently. We have a killer regional manager. That's her title. But I mean, she's really just jack of all trades, like keeps the stores running perfect. Like I don't worry about them anymore. I think about them. Yeah. And she's been a killer team member in that regard. And we have a great ops manager who communicates with the franchisees better than we ever could yeah and and she also helps us with like e-com operations that Mm -hmm. side of things but as we grow the business that's been our main focus is putting the right team in place kind of like if you put it into like sports analogy it's like i have like so much budget to buy certain players and like i'm trying to get like the best ones i possibly can on the cheap at this point in time but most our, our biggest focus on that is always like operations because it's not something that our strong suit is Mm -hmm. like we're both pretty creative and there's something to be said about like being really detail oriented, really organized and operationally minded that I have a ton of respect for. Yeah. I totally, like, I think this is the one thing I would say younger entrepreneurs struggle with. It's like for some reason they don't want to learn how to hire people. Like hiring people is hard, right? I mean, let's play it out. One, they can leave. Two, what do you do then? Three, hiring is, they've never done it before. So it's like learning a whole new sport and they think it's easy and it's totally not easy as you guys know. But I think it's like the best thing people can learn, like out, outsource, delegate, become an executive, stop being a project manager. Yeah, the other you know? struggle is when you are starting from the ground up and I experienced this, you don't want to release any control to anyone else because your mindset is, this is my thing. Nobody else can do it as good as I can. I'm just going to have to do it all. And I did that in the beginning. I think the first scoop shop, I was probably working like every day in it because I was like, 
nobody can manage this like I can. They don't know the cookie dough. They don't understand. Which is partially true to some extent. It's like it you, is. you own it. And but so, then you get to a point where you're like, well, I can't do it all or else this is the end of No Bake's life. You know, this is yeah. as far as it's going to go. So you have to release control and accept that things won't be perfect. But there's tons of people that are great that are capable of doing things, you know, as well as you. Will you guys ever remove yourselves as, uh, let's call it like the co-CEOs and have bring in someone else and make you guys more like a chairman? We've chairwoman. We've thought about that concept a lot recently. Yeah. Just as we begin the path to scale, yeah. it's interesting because it's like you really want to have the right people in the right seats, but sometimes the right people is like a moving target. So like right now, That's, I think it's important yeah, for us to be like that for the company like Megan's titles CEO and mine's like chief strategy officer. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what that means. Sure. I just made it up. <laughs> it's um, for the world. It's for yeah, society. For the world. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but our goal right now is like Megan attempts to like really, really focus on like brand products. I attempt to focus on building relationships and creating like sales from like a prospecting perspective. Like what can I do to go out into the world and just be myself and let our product be itself and make connections and like when it comes to finance and operations, which is like the other side of the business, like how can we hire for that right now to support what we're doing, whether it be outsourcing it, which I've had a lot of very smart people tell me that's the way to go. I've had a lot of people that are really smart tell me like, no, you need to hire people in house, pay them with equity and like create a culture. It's two different mindsets. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, like we I'll have be, to choose between. I'll give you my take on this. It, it's totally personal to you. So for me, when I had a tech company, I hated like I hated hearing about my employees Tinder date and how it went bad and why they were in a bad mood all day. Like, I'm like, I'm not your therapist. Yeah. I'm here to hustle. And look, this is a me thing. Like I know people are going to listen and be like, ah, what a dick. But, and that's <laughs> totally okay. Like that you should, you should take that judgment because I'm being me. Yeah. Like I am not that guy. I'm not, I don't want to be the mom in the office. Like I just want to go come in, execute. And I want to go home early so I can go work out or like eat my food the way I want to eat it. Not be in the office till 7 PM Uber eating. And so it was this thing where it's like totally a personal decision. And for me, I hated, I literally, I, I met with one of our investors and he was like, jot down, there's like this app you can get. It's like an extension to Chrome. And he's like, just jot down your, all your time. So when you get into the office, email time, team time, therapist time, when you're getting your team back to like normal. And literally 45% of my day was spent on making sure my guys were ready to perform all day because they're in their 20s. And, you know, they're experiencing real life, like yeah. they're maybe hungover, which is totally fine. Like, I'm not I'm not saying don't do that, th those things. It's just like I didn't personally enjoy being the person that had to resuscitate them back to normal human life. And that's a me problem. And so I was like, OK, so here are my options. Now that I know who I am, I can either hire someone who's good at that, like a really good ops person who can make them feel fuzzy. Or I can be like, no, this isn't the business for me. I'm just going to go do I'm going to take a left and like leave and I'm going to go do what I want to do. But it's a personal decision. So for me, that's why I'm not in tech anymore. And I'll never be the guy who has like 200 employees. Like that's not, that is so not me. That's when you're just a leader. <laughs> like that's when you become a leader and that's what you are. And that's why like in real estate development, my job is really to hire the experts. That's what we do now. And so it's like, I can't be the architect. I can't be the engineers, but you know, I can wrangle everybody together and make sure everyone's executing. But I'm also not their parent. I'm not in the office with them. I'm not hearing, you know, I'm just making sure everything's hitting the timelines it needs to hit. And so that's more suited for me. So that's why I do what I do now. And it's a lot more suited to like me. But it's also a function of knowing who you are. That's really what this is. Like business will have a way of showing you who you really are. And that's okay too. Like lean in. I just lean yeah. fully into being me unapologetically. And, and, you know, in business, obviously you guys are together in it, but it's also there's differing opinion there too. And so you, it, you have to find a way to do what you want to do while you do what you want to do. And so, you know, the brand building to me is super fun, right? I mean, that's like, who doesn't like doing that? Yeah. Yeah. That's and the, so the best part. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's just my story. on like how I would make the decision based on what you really want to do. That's how I feel about like choosing, whether it be a CEO or, or a COO or like other people to bring in house. Like it has a lot to do with that. What you just talked about, like, what do we just not like doing? Because that's why we stopped leaning into the scoop shops because we felt like it wasn't the best way to get our product out there distribution wise, like with the impact, but it's also not what we like to doing. And if you don't like something, 
you gotta don't stop. Don't do it. Yeah. 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 You just have to stop. I think that's another lesson. It's like, if you don't like it, don't do it. Like let procrastination be your guide, right? It's like, if you don't want to do that thing and your body's like, uh, like lean it, listen to that right. and go, I need to hire someone to do this or find another way, whatever that looks like. Like I'm a big fan of automation. And so I mostly try to outsource things. That's just me again, going back to that story before it's like delegate and outsource. That's it. It makes my life simple. You and a lot of other people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I said, like, I think society has a way of clouding that for some people. Like they're like, Oh, why am I a bad person? And sometimes you like have this like desire to have a team just yeah. because like people will go out. It's, it's all these things that people want to like brag yeah. about. Like Having my, a team my is head sweet. count is this, <laughs> yeah. my revenue is this, yeah. we raise this much money, Yeah, these, whatever it might be. These vanity metrics. Yeah. So the two things I'm solving for. So I shared one impact. The second thing is time. And so I want to have all my time. That's my metric. And so how do I do that? Employees is not that way, no. right? Employees and time are completely at opposite ends of that spectrum. Yeah. Cause you always end up putting a lot of time into like just managing those people. <laughs> yeah. No, the tech company for me, it was more of, um, so we had this company where I'm convinced the idea is going to work. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced that they'll solve the problem. It's just going to take another, like, I'm going to say by 2030, they'll solve the problem. And so for me, it became a, a situation where, do I really want to do this for another seven to 10 years? And the answer for that was pretty quickly, like, absolutely not. But we had these, you know, pretty big investors, like big names in Silicon Valley and stuff. And so I know pe people would view the company in a nice way. But I also had the intimate knowledge of knowing it's a good idea. It's just not going to be something that's a home run for another seven to 10 years. And I didn't, I didn't want to be with it at all. And so I was able to luckily, like, sell my shares of the company, which was fun and an interesting process. It's like an interesting chess game. It's like, I have information that like, I know exactly what's happening, right? I'm in the business yeah. and their optics are, we're betting on the future of the business. And so you're trading what you know for what could happen. Right. And it's a very weird moment, actually. That it's, is interesting. It's a very strange game where it's not a, it's not like you're lying. It's not like you're like, no, that could never be. It's more of like, this is a home run, but it's a home run in 2030. And so there's a reason I'm selling also, right? So from their perspective, it's like, oh, if, you, if that's the case, why are you selling? And it's like, well, I don't want any affiliation to something that I'm not a part of, right? So that's like a personal thing for me. And so I just want to sell it off. And even if I'm taking a haircut or whatever, I don't care. Like, I just don't want, I don't want to think about it. I don't want the mind share. I just want to be out. And so, you know, you, you trade on that, on that information. And so I was like, all right, I'm done. And that was it. And I got all my time back, yeah. which was something I was solving for. And then I moved to LA and I was like, wow, the real estate here is really weird. Could we do something in the real estate development game? And I just was like, look, sure. People always ask me, how did I get into it? And I'm always like, I just decided. And that was it. And, but, but the thing is like the building blocks are, I knew how to raise capital. I knew how to put a deal together, mm -hmm. you know? And so those things are the same. And then somehow I had to lean back. Maybe you felt this as you're raising with your finance background. Like I was a civil engineer thinking I would never, ever in my life be in construction or around that world. And now I am literally, yeah. right? And it makes me better. Like, honestly, it makes me a better developer because I can read plans. Most developers are finance people who can't, they can't read drawings. They don't know what things mean. They can, they can understand them at a high level, but not, you can't be like, no, this is, this is like what a footing looks like. This footing is not right. You know, like things like that. And so it made me a sharper, I guess, developer. And so it's a weird way of like life all comes back in some way. And everything you've learned has a way of coming back and culminating into making you a sharper individual. Yeah. Jimmy's financial background has definitely helped us even just understanding, you know, the concept of raising money. Yeah. I think understanding deal terms and then what you said about selling your shares makes a lot of sense in a lot of different ways because a lot of people don't necessarily understand the reason to raise capital, especially from a startup's perspective when you're us, when it's like, what are you guys doing with this money? They're like, why do you need it? And, and why in the world is it eventually going to be so valuable that, you know, this makes sense as an investment. And when it's something that burns cash, like, you know, I'm going to take this product into the grocery store and I need to acquire new customers. Or running a subscription business, acquire new customers, running a software business, acquire new customers. It's all about like bringing money behind a good product so you can get it out in front of people. Yeah. 
because these days like we we run like an information and attention economy so like you need money to get attention and that attention is currency that allows your product to get out there just because you have a cool product or a cool song or you got talent or whatever it might be that doesn't mean anything unless people watch which is really interesting to like get into well i mean like i'm an investor today and whenever i give i write a check or whatever it's like I don't hold this, the founders accountable in any capacity. I'm like, th- I believe in this idea and I believe you're the person to execute it. And like, there's no strings attached. Use me however you want. I won't check in with you. I won't ask you any questions. I'm just a fan. Like I'm a fan and I'm showing you this check as a function of energy. This is me saying I've built this energy and now I'm giving it to you. And so money, my relationship with money has totally changed also. Like I don't, and it's not because I have it. It's more of like a mindset, like to what you're saying, like the currency is the eyeballs. The currency is getting your product out there. It's the impact. The currency is not the money. The money just allows that to facilitate a little bit easier. Yeah. You know, it's like the plumbing. Yeah. And the way that you said, like, I'm just a fan, like when you invest in a company, like whether it be like public company or you go to a crowdfunding site and invest in something like our company or you're an angel and like, you know, you write like a hundred thousand dollar check to this cool new startup, like you really should be doing it based off the product. Mm -hmm. Like I hate when people are like, what was the past performance like? It's great to ask about sales (laughs) because sales are like basically validation. Yeah. Like if I say like we've sold like seven, $8 million of cookie dough over four years, you'd be like, cool. That means seven, $8 million worth of people. Like they, they put that energy into like getting that product. So that's validation, but like profitability, like business model maybe is like, you, you want to get into that, but those things can shift and change when the product, that's not going to change. And if people don't like the product, that's not good. Yeah. <laughs> if they like the product and you're just not getting it to market in the right way, or you just need more money to be able to get the attention, to get the product out there, whatever that might be. Yeah. I think those are, that just is the name of the game. But if your product's bad, <laughs> It's probably where you should start. Like, do I like this thing? I think like business 101 investing is like, uh, you want to, at minimum, you want to invest in the product that's doing so well, despite the idiots running. The company. <laughs> yeah. Like that's okay. That like would that, be an awesome That just company. saved you like awesome a product. Stanford MBA. Like literally <laughs> don't go just right. Because anyone can solve that. Like a private equity firm could solve that. You mm-hmm. as an investor might be able to solve that. And like you said, it's the whole, it's the product. And that's why private equity buys those companies all the time. Totally. It's yeah. Like, that's like, what they're good at. Exactly. Like, we can solve this. We're good at building a brand and a product and getting sales. They can come in and figure out how to like increase margin. Yeah. I mean, you can't start from like a really bad spot. That's the other thing in CPG that gets really frustrating. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this. You've had some other guys that were in CPG on the podcast yeah. and people focus on gross margin like it is the end of the world. And I understand why, because if you don't have a good gross margin story, like the product will never scale. And that's a fact. But if you have a path to gross margin and maybe a path to profit, that's not, you know, built on fairy tales. It's built on like real actual research data, partnerships, commitments that matters. But like, I hate when someone wants to look at it like an entrepreneur, especially someone who's younger, like thinking about starting this business and they may not, they may do it. And you just look at them and you're like, gross margins aren't there. Just give up. Like you can't say that to someone that's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I learned in raising capital a long time ago is once I'm getting those questions, I'll, I'll leave, I'll end the meeting. Yeah. I'm like, this isn't for you. Yeah. Like I'll tell the investor, this is not for you. And, and frankly, and I also tell them like, look, If you're looking at my five-year projections and you're trying to like be like yeah like you're an idiot like don't look at those like i'm lying to you yeah (laughs) i'm gonna be wrong it's just made up i'm gonna be wrong (laughs) for sure i'm gonna be wrong that's that's the thing with like finance people like i'm trying to find the right like outsourced cfo right now to to help us kind of like build out the plan for the next however many years and they're always like so do you guys have a budget i'm like yeah we have like a loose budget they're like do you have sales projections i'm like i mean i could they would be wrong. They've never been right. I've I've done it before. I did a whole entire projection before the pivot to e-com. The numbers that we hit in April of 2020 were the numbers I thought we'd hit in April of 2021. Right. So it was like... That's a happy problem. What? Yeah, it's a happy problem. And then <laughs> there's yeah. the reverse of like, I did projections for like new stores and the store does like 80% or 70% of the revenue I thought it would. And it completely throws off the financial model. Yeah. Which 
shouldn't have even been like leaned into that much in the first place. I mean, I'm dealing with that now. So we're building out a brewery in Cider House and as you guys may have seen in the news, lumber prices and basically all material costs are significantly up. And so here I had a beautiful model. I'm like, this is great. I have 20% markup just in case on the construction side. And now I'm facing like a 40% issue just for materials. And so it's, it's like, okay, let's rewrite the model. You know, let's I, go back to the investors and I go, guess Hey, I let's tell the future. You can't. And the thing is like, it doesn't even bother me, you know, they'll, and so I just lean into being transparent with the investors saying like, look, this is a situation. I'm sure you guys have all seen it in the headlines. We need more capital. It's that simple. The good news is the returns aren't impacted that much. Like you're fine. In, in other words, like you're going to make money. It may have not be, it may have, it's like it went from a grand slam to like an inside the park home run. Like we're still good. <laughs> it's different now. And that's just how it goes, which is I okay. hadn't thought about that for your world. Did that like impact a lot of people? Not so much people. It just, I mean, well, I guess it did. In, in my world, it just made things more expensive. And so if you're tight on capital, it's going to make things tough for the entire, like any, any developer yeah. effectively. And but the whole ecosystem, you guys have to raise rent, maybe. This is a good question. So yes and no. So I go back to like, you're in real estate development. My number one job is to keep my tenant alive. That's how I look at it. That's the approach I take, right? Because ultimately they're the ones providing income to the asset. And so I am very much of the mindset, help your tenant. That's me. Yeah. Help them stay alive. So if you give them a super high rent that they can't pay, it's not good for their business, right? And so they're, they're going to end up renegotiating their lease or canceling, and now you have a bigger problem. Yeah. And so my mindset always goes to keep them alive. But in that, I'm also honest with them being like, look, we just spent 500000 more, whatever that number is, on this project, and we have to recoup that in some way. And so what are your options? Let's look at other ways of getting debt, right? You can refinance early. Right. And so there's other, basically there's like a lot of different bullets you can take. One of them being raise the rent, but, but that's, that's the just most simple one. answer. That's the simple yeah. one for sure. And I'm, I'm definitely saying it's on the table, but it's like something I'll put uh, at the bottom of the list. You know, it's worst case scenario. That makes sense. Yeah. The other thing in LA is like, we have a lot of, you know, taking a long-term view, the Olympics are coming in 2028. Yeah. And so with all the infrastructure build out happening, it's like, I'm going to be on the receiving end of that wave. And at a certain point in the future, that's amazing. Yeah. Like you see what I'm saying? Like all the assets, all the real estate becomes that much more like we're going to, there's an uplift yeah. by doing nothing other than the Olympics coming. Yeah. I, I so think I'm that's not really worried about it. I'm not like, it's not concerning to me. It's just more of like an annoying problem I have to deal with, which yeah. is we all deal with them. I get really fascinated by stuff like that because it always affects like short term cash or like short term, like, Where's the money going right now? Is there money in the bank to pay these bills? But everybody seems to have this understanding. Like I posted on LinkedIn the other day, this poll. I was just like, do you think it's more important to have a path to profit or to make money right now? And like 87% of people were like path to profit. And this poll gets like 300 people to answer it. And I'm like, wow, it's crazy. But that's the flip side of like what, how like, I guess like a bank would look at something like today or how some people like will like get short term minded about stuff when they get scared. Yeah. But whenever there's no fear involved or someone's just asked the question, they're like, Oh, well, path to profit. Let's make value. Yeah. Like let's grow something cool or do what you said, like just solve for impact, yeah. build this cool building, this cool development, develop this tenant, make this cool thing happen, right. build a community. Yeah. But like fear gets in the way of that a lot because short term cash is, I mean, it is important to pay your bills. I've killed that in my head. I don't have that anymore. That's good. The fear is gone. Yeah. Like, that's I'm like, a good oh. thing. If I'm alive, I'm like, if I'm alive, I'll figure it out. Like yeah. if I'm waking up tomorrow, uh, there's not a problem I can't solve. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's my approach. And the only thing that gets everything. me upset, like yesterday, this happened yesterday. So right now I'm like, okay, I had to revisit the model. I'm raising more capital. And I was upset yesterday because it was Sunday and nobody works on Sunday. So I'm here modeling this out and I like <laughs> want to get it. I want to solve the problem, yeah. but I can't because if I send this email out, no one's going to read it today. Right. See what I'm saying? Because it's Sunday. And so I'm like, that's the thing that gets me. It's it's sometimes the society has a way of impacting progress. And so first thing Monday morning comes in and I'm like, I'm all right, done. Email's done. Shipped it out. Let's start solving the problem. If it was Saturday, it'd be even worse. And so, you know, that's how I look at it. I think being able to eliminate fears is an important part of entrepreneurship. Yeah. I think you learn it. You learn how to yeah. do it because you realize it does nothing for you. Like you realize in the, your fearful state, you're just being selfish. Yeah. Your business isn't improving. You're not putting your product out there and you're coming from a place of like defense. Yep. Yeah. 
and I just play offense. Like I'll play defense when I'm a CEO of like a public company and I have to play defense, mm -hmm. but that'll never happen because I have no interest in employees. Again, <laughs> so I'm just going to play offense. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. yeah. I think that's important to say. And like the continue to saying to like other people and just reinforcing the like mindset and the thought process. Like, hey, if we focus on creating value, and solving problems, we'll figure it out. Yeah. It sounds ridiculous to like a VC <laughs> or like a bank. They're just like, what do you mean you're just going to figure it out? But you'll figure it out. You'll figure it it's out. It's going to happen. That's how life works. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys, for coming on. Yeah. Thank you so having. much. Where can people find you? And try your delicious products. So our website is nobakedcookiedough.com. And then all social media is just no baked. No baked. Yep. Support these guys. I like it. <laughs> <I'm watching laughs> Thank you. Guys you. Coming on. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Thanks you. so much.